Yesterday we stopped at chapter three about how to approach the Dharma. The Dharma, the Dharma is not a secret or is esoteric, esoteric teaching. And let's define esoteric here. It's not something intended for or likely to be understood by only a small number of people with a specialized knowledge or interest. Yeah, this is not the Dhamma. The Dhamma is not a secret. The Dhamma shines when taught openly. Okay, I'm going to read the next paragraph. With chapter four, we come to text dealing with the first of the three types of benefit the Buddha's teaching is intended to bring. This is called the welfare and happiness visible in this present life. Dita Dhamma Hita Sukha. The happiness that comes from following ethical norms in one's family, relationships, livelihood, and communal activities. Although early Buddhism is often depicted as a radical discipline of renunciation directed to a transcendental goal, the Nikayas reveal the Buddha to have been a compassionate and pragmatic teacher who was intent on promoting a social order in which people can live together peacefully and harmoniously in accordance with ethical guidelines. These aspects of early Buddhism is evident in the Buddha's teaching on the duties of children to their parents, on the mutual obligations of husbands and wives, on right livelihood, on the duties of the ruler towards his subjects, and on the principles of communal harmony and respect. This one is especially relevant on the duties of the ruler towards his subject when there was a lot of like uh, masters and slaves or kings and their servants. And in the modern context, it's about employers and their employees. The last one on the principles of communal harmony and respect. This is about harmony within the society, within any society. It can be a, a club or even Buddhist societies too. Any kind of society. The Buddha also taught how to be in harmony and respect. Next paragraph. Sister Saike, which I like The second type of benefit to which the Buddha's teaching leads is the subject of chapter five called The Welfare and Happiness Pertaining to Future Life. Samparaika um, Hitasuka. This is the happiness achieved by obtaining a fortunate rebirth and success in future lives through one's accumulation of merit. The term merit, punya, refers to wholesome karma. Sanskrit is spelled as K-A-R-M-A, considered in terms of its capacity to produce favorable results within the round of rebirth. I begin this chapter with a selection of texts on the teaching of karma and rebirth. This leads us to general texts on the idea of merit, followed by selections on the three principal bases of merit recognized in the Buddha's discourse, giving, dana, moral discipline, sila, and meditation, bhavana. Since meditation figures prominently in the third type of benefit, the kind of meditation emphasized here as a basis for merit is that productive of the most abundant mundane fruits, the four divine abodes, Brahma Viharas, particularly the development of loving kindness. Thanks, Sister Saikin. Uh, the previous paragraph we read about 
how the teachings, the Dhamma, can lead to welfare and happiness in this present life. This paragraph, the paragraph that Sai Kiang reads, is about happiness towards future life. So this will be covered in chapter five. The next paragraph, Sister Jolene, would you like to read? Yes, brother. Um, chapter six is transitional, intended to prepare the way for the chapters to follow, while demonstrating that the practice of his teaching does indeed conduce to happiness and good fortune within the bounds of mundane life. In order to lead people beyond these bounds, the Buddha exposes the danger and inadequacy in all condition and existence. He shows the defects, essential pleasures, the shortcomings of material success, the inevitability of death, impermanence of all conditioned realms of being, to arouse in his disciples an aspiration for the ultimate good, Nibbana, the Buddha again and again underscores the perils of samsara. Thus, this chapter comes to a climax with two dramatic texts that dwell on the misery of bondage to the round of repeated birth and death. Thanks, Sister Jelly. Thank you, brother. So chapter six is transitional before jumping into the sections where the teachings is intended to bring the ultimate good. We could body use this chapter to prepare us to show what firstly the defects in sensual pleasures, the shortcomings of material success, the inevitability of death, and the impermanence of all conditioned realms of being. Next paragraph, Sister, Sister Billy, would you like to read? The following four chapters are devoted to the third benefit that the Buddha's teaching is intended to bring the ultimate good. Paramatta, the attainment of Nibbana. The first of these, chapter seven, gives a general overview of the path to liberation, which is treated analytically through definitions of the practice of the Noble Eightfold Path and dynamically through an account of the training of the monk. A long sutta on the graduated path surveys the monastic training from the monk's initial entry upon the life of renunciation to his attainment of Arahanship, the final goal. Okay. Thanks, Sister Billy. Okay, the first of this chapter, the the four chapters that devoted to the Third benefit of the Buddha's teaching, the ultimate good, the attainment of Nirvana. Chapter seven, it gives the general overview of the path to liberation. Starting from the noble level path, and then on the graduated path, surface the monastic training. From the monk's initial entry, upon the life of renunciation, to the attainment of arahanship, the final goal. Next paragraph, Sister Aikim, would you like to read? Chapter 8 focuses upon the taming of the mind, the major emphasis in the monastic training. I here present texts that discuss the obstacles to mental development, the means of overcoming these obstacles, different methods of meditation, and the states to be attained when the obstacles are overcome and the disciple gains mastery over the mind. In this chapter, I introduce the distinction between samatha and vipassana, serenity and insight, the one leading to samadhi or concentration, the other to panya or wisdom. However, I 
include text that treat insights only in terms of the methods used to generate it, not in terms of this actual contents. Thanks, Sister Akim. So chapter eight focuses more on the mastery of the mind. The distinction between samatha and vipassana, serenity and insight. Okay, next paragraph, Sister Singhui, which you to read? Chapter 9, titled Shining the Light of Wisdom, deals with the content of insight. For early Buddhism, and indeed for almost all schools of Buddhism, insight or wisdom is the principal instrument of liberation. Thus, in this chapter, I focus on the Buddha's teachings about such topics pivotal to the development of wisdom as bright view, the five aggregates, the six sense base, the 18 elements, dependent origination, and the four noble truths. This chapter ends with a selection of texts on Nibbana, the ultimate goal of wisdom. Sister Singhui. The previous paragraph ends with Yukubodi includes the text that trace insight only in terms of the methods used to generate it, but not in terms of actual contents of insight. Then the next paragraph, Shining the Light of Wisdom, where Biku, is where Bikubodi defaults this chapter with the content of insight. So, so we can see how the, each chapter gradually builds up to the final goal. The contents include development of wisdom as right view, the five aggregates, the six sense bases, 18 elements, dependent origination, and the four noble truths. Okay, next paragraph, I'll read one more. The final goal is not achieved abruptly, but by passing through a series of stages that transforms an individual from a worldling into an arahant, a liberated one. Thus, chapter 10, the planes of realization offers a selection of texts on the main stages along the way. I first present this series of stages as a progressive sequence. Then I return to the starting point and examine three major milestones within this progression. Stream entry, the states of non returner and arahanship. I conclude with the selection of suttas on the Buddha, the foremost among the Arahants. Here spoken of under the epithet he used most, often when referring to himself, the Tathagata. Okay, that's all for the general introduction about the structure of the teaching. In the days to come, we will explore the origins of the Nikayas the background of the text, which we will read. Any questions or comments so far? If not, let's do a dedication. Yen Xiao San Zhang Chu Fan, Yen De Chi Hui Chen Ming Liao, Hu Yen Zui Zhang Xi Xiao Chu, Amitabha. Me again. May we be guided by the Buddha, Dhamma, and the Sangha. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Have a nice Saturday ahead. So, any of you joining Long Pause Talk? Oh, Billy. Okay, Jolene too. Okay, good, good. Very good. Thanks for participating. I'll see you guys next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.